So a couple of weeks ago, I made a video about an old shed that I put up in 1986. It was the first building on our homestead property here. I didn't build it very well at the time. I didn't know what I was doing, and a lot of years have, have elapsed. But I've decided to rejuvenate the shed, you know, wonky as it is. Uh, you can check out that original introduction video in the description box. Uh, but right now, I want to show you what I'm doing with uh, cedar shingles and other wall treatments that's going to make the old shed look great and last for a long time. Let's take a look. Cedar shingles um, is, what I, is, is what I'm putting on here now, and that's most of what I want to talk to you about now. Uh, despite the fact that it's old and wonky, I'm kind of pulling out all the stops here just the same to do a, a good job. And the cedar wall shingles that I have going on, um, there's a lot of interesting things about them. Uh, these are white cedar shingles, and I'm going to be showing you more about how they go on in a minute. But instead of applying them directly to the wall surface, I've done a kind of a drainage plane design here. So this is the wood uh, of the shed. This is three quarter inch pressure treated plywood that I put over the old siding just to strengthen it and give me a solid base to anchor these shingles. Uh, now we've got a, a breathable membrane here. Uh, this is different than building wrap. Uh, I don't really like building wrap. It's flimsy and weak. It deteriorates because of the glue that's used in wafer board. Uh, and it also can trap moisture behind it. Uh, this is different. This is a lot stronger. Can you tell the story of that building wrapped house after the rainstorm that you came across? Oh, uh, yeah. This is just one example of many. Uh, building going up. Uh, building wrap on the outside, taped joints, the whole shebang. Siding wasn't on yet, driving rain. It doesn't take much for rain to get into a little, a little uh, opening somewhere. And basically there was, there was water held against the frame of the house uh, by the building wrap. It was kind of bulging out. You can stick a knife into it and have water leak out. And, um, this stuff is different in that it's stronger, but it's also completely breathable. So. It, it allows, uh, it, it sheds water, it sheds liquid water, but if water gets behind it, it still has the ability to dry. You can kind of see the breathable, porous surface when we get in close here. Yeah, well, and it, it's great stuff. So this protects the building frame. Uh, and I, these corner boards, I, I've done the same sort of material underneath the corner boards before they went on so I could join it. So here's your, your first defense of the wood uh, against water. Uh, and then this stuff here. Uh, this is called Delta Dry and it's this kind of dimpled plastic layer and its job is to create a two-sided vertical drainage channel in case any water gets in. Uh, moisture, condensation, whatever gets past the shingles. If it gets this far it can still drain down and the whole thing is open at the bottom. So basically the shingles just held away from the siding. And if moisture ever develops behind this, it's the same thing. It can drain down and it will come out underneath at the bottom. I mean, these shingles are, are, are tight to the bottom, but if moisture did get behind, it could still get out. Now, um, down here, I used a pressure treated wood bottom board and there's going to be some uh, some mulch or a little bit of soil kind of added here to, to bring this level but this wood here is made for pressure treated wood foundations so it never rots so it's actually more highly treated than your standard pressure treated right much more much more i mean this is for building wooden foundations below ground and they do that sort of thing and it's been building code uh here where i live for more than 40 years it works. Well, they they've, just, they've tested some like burying it in wet soil for 50 years or something and it was fine, didn't they? Well, um, the U.S. Uh, Forest Service began testing pressure treated lumber in the 1920s when it was a new idea. And they, they buried test stakes in the ground in their, in their test facility. And every so often they dig them up. And so this is wood, pressure treated wood that's been buried since the 1920s, almost 100 years. And it's fine. There's no rot. So wood can be treated so that it never rots. And that's what this board is all about. But I didn't want water. I didn't want any chance for water, if it gets past the shingles, to get behind this. 
So I had some copper flashing built, uh, bent. You know, this, this, uh, this is the lip down over the edge. It goes horizontally and then vertically a ways. And it all sits behind this um, drainage membrane stuff I'm telling you about. So water comes down here, it hits here, it goes down. It doesn't go behind anything. It also looks quite nice. Looks copper. quite nice. It's gonna get it's gonna get kind of greenish when it oxidizes. Time. Yeah, but I think that's gonna be fine. Why did I go with copper? Uh, a two foot by eight foot piece of copper is almost one hundred and fifty dollars. So it's pretty expensive. Way more expensive than aluminum. But there's really no option here, especially with this pressure treated stuff, because <clears throat> the preservative chemicals in the wood. Um, can be highly corrosive to certain kinds of metal. <clears throat> Aluminum is one of them. It'll just turn to paper. It'll just turn all full of holes as it as it corrodes in the presence of the pressure treatment chemicals. Um, not so copper. Copper can resist all that. So 24 gauge is quite strong, and uh, and it does a good job too. So cutting more a little more of this delta vents stuff to go higher up the wall, eh? Yeah, I um, I want to show everyone how this process works so uh, I'm just gonna continue on so the black stuff goes on I'm gonna cut a bit of this Delta dry and then I'm gonna show you uh, how I make it as easy as possible to align the shingles and get the courses level and just make it work and what are those orange fasteners holding on the black stuff well I'm gonna show you that that's um, that's something from a tool called a cap stapler and it shoots staples and those orange caps, which hold down fabric like this. Uh, it does a great job. It's it's actually an amazing tool. And uh, I never use just staples directly because staples don't have a large holding area. So the fabric can pull off quite easily. And uh, yeah, that'll be just fine. As you explained in the first video, the whole building's kind of out of plumb, which is why you're using this uh, Bosch. Yeah, I just want to determine angle. the angle that I need to cut the side of this dimpled stuff on. Because it's and not going to be 90, that's for sure. No, no. I, I have never worked on a ship before. The trim work in a ship, but I've heard that's kind of what working on a ship is like. Nothing's quite square because of the angles that they have to work at. Yeah, because the whole ship is curved and things, yeah. Exactly. And, and so getting things to fit varies in different places. So I kind of just pretend I'm working on a ship here, not on a wonky old building. Whatever gets you through. Right. <laughs> Possibly be this far off, but let's see. Let's see if it fits. Fabric type stuff. It's got some thickness to it, so it holds the, the feeder away. Um, the thing is, uh, I find this works better. This gives a better, uh, more space. It's, it's firmer as well. It can be used with not just cedar shingles, but any kind of wood siding. Any kind of wood siding benefits from being able to drain behind it. Won't be any behind the scenes rot that way. Well, that and also the fact that uh, finishes will last longer when moisture isn't trying to escape through the wood. Uh, that's one of the problems with older houses that in this day and age of central heating in Canada, you get a lot more moisture moving through the old wood frame walls not unusual in older wooden houses to find areas where you just can't keep the paint on the siding and, uh, and that's because that's a condensation hot spot within the wall and moisture starts to move through the wood it can't it can't get in any other way so you have frequent rapid finish failure um, as well as cupping and warping and all kinds so I'll just shoot one in here. This is that cap stapler. I'm going to use it to put on this this breathable membrane here. But essentially, it, it shoots these staples at the same time as shooting it through the cap. So it's just like that. 
Oh. Very secure. These tools have been around for a while. They're not too common. There aren't too many companies that make them. But boy, are they good. From this angle, I'm sort of noticing how the trim around the door is pretty thick. Like It looks like full thickness, inch and a half lumber. How come you went so thick on the trim? Well, because I needed to accommodate, I needed to accommodate the whole profile of the shingles and then this, this dimpled layer here too. And if you look on the edge, the inch and a half is just barely thick enough to handle that. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. At any one given spot, there are three layers of shingles. So the shingles develop a, a certain amount of uh, thickness on their own, and then more so because of that dimpled layer. So. Do a little trimming here and then we'll get the, the gray stuff on. Got a interlock at the bottom, of course. Overlap and interlock. And it is a little too wide, so I'm gonna have to cut it. To fit. So the cap stapler works just as well on this stuff too. So I'm not going to go too high with these cap staples because I need to put some more stuff on top and it has to overlap as well. So but now you're free to advance up a little further with the shingles. Right. Now, uh, I'm only working in this small area just so I can show you, but I don't, I, I want the courses to be level and I want them to be even. In the straight in the same plane so i always use a, a strip of wood now this is short enough so i'm gonna i'm gonna fasten this piece of wood here temporarily and it's gonna form a ledge on which the shingles rest how are you gonna fasten it well i'm gonna show you because i have to fasten it in a way that doesn't leave big gaping holes in the shingles so i have a method for that so i'm just gonna level this if i was doing a longer wall i would establish level points along the wall using a laser level. I could use a water level too, but those those points then give me a level plane and I can measure down from there to fasten this strip. So, but because this is short, I can just uh, do the same thing with a level and uh, this thing. This is a pin nailer. Maybe some of you know what a pin nailer does. It shoots these, these little fasteners. They're about the diameter of a sewing needle. They have no head. So they're highly invisible and very small. But they hold surprisingly well. In this case, I only need it to hold on the strip temporarily. So I'm just going to shoot one at either end. And that's sufficient to create this ledge. And then we pull it off and pull the pin out. Well, I so, guess the wood would kind of swell shut with such a tiny hole. Yeah, it's not a big deal. And, you know, even if water did get in, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, it would just it would just drain down from that, that drainage membrane that I, that I created. So. so uh, with this installation, I'm uh, 
aiming for a five inch exposure. So that's the exposure, how much of the shingle is actually seen. Five inches is what I'm aiming for. So I'm going to make a mark here, five inches up, level it, fasten that thing on. I should mention though, that there's a certain amount of steering that involved in, in shingling like this. I mean, for instance, um, ideally I don't want to have some, some little wee bit of shingle required under this windowsill. Which might work out to happen if you just strictly go by five inches. Well, it would. It would. You're never going to get it lined up perfectly. So, for instance, um, I, I'm going to, these other courses, I'm going to steer the space. I'm going to vary the spacing a little bit. You can vary the spacing at least an eighth, maybe even a quarter of an inch per course, and it won't be noticeable to the eye. But it will allow you to, to home in on the situation that you want. In this case, I would want the bottom edge of the course of shingles here to be kind of level with the bottom of the windowsill. So I've measured this previously, and it's just a little less than 20 inches from here to here. So if it was 20 inches exactly, I would just stick with the five inch spacing, four courses, five inch spacing, and I'd be done. But it's a little less, so I'm gonna have to steer that. I'm gonna make it maybe four and seven eighths. Uh, you'll know, no one will notice that, but I'll steer it. Now you just have to recognize that you, you gotta see these things a little bit ahead of time so that you have time to do them. Yeah, the nothing makes a cedar shingle job on a building look worse than uh, those sickly little narrow strips on the bottom of windows and well, doors. Well, they don't last. They, They're gonna they fall, fall off, off they rot. Of yeah. Now in this case, I have, I have a particular challenge because the shed is, as I said, it's, it's, it's not level, it's wonky. Um, the bottom edge of this course of shingles is not in the same plane as the bottom course that it should line up with. There's a discrepancy of at least a few inches. That much, eh? That much. So what I'm gonna do is, now, so, so this course is higher than this course, the corresponding course on the other side of the door. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna massage that a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this side slightly greater spacing and this side slightly less spacing so that when we come up here, they're all in the same course. Because if I didn't do that, I'd have one course here and one course here, and they'd meet over the door, but they wouldn't line up. So it's gonna, it would be- That ugly. would be a nightmare. Right, yeah. so I have to kind of balance that. It's kind of the same way with brick laying. You know, bricks look regular, uh, and they are, but brick layers can do marvelous things with very crude bricks that have a difference in height or difference in, in length. And they do that by varying, slightly varying the thickness of the mortar joint. And it's the same with this. If you slightly vary things, your eye won't tell, and you can steer it the way you want to. So. The trick is to see it enough ahead of time that you have enough courses to work with to spread that right. out. Right, and, and the, the way you do that is by messing up in the past <laughs> and remembering the horror of that. Right. So, anyway, combination square set to five inches. I'm just going to make a slight mark here. Now, uh, it's of course important that the staples be up above the overlap zone by an inch, an inch and a half or so. You don't want them too far up above though, otherwise you'll have curling shingle syndrome. Right, you want it as low as possible while also remaining clear of any um, issues with leaking and stuff. So so leveling the shingles here is, leveling this, this um, support strip is easy here, but I'm just using the level. It's such a small distance. Okay. So I'm ready to roll, and I'm going to shoot in a pin here, and a pin here. Can you see that? Not very, not so, very. Well, there's a few. Yeah, from where I had done them before. They sure are small. Yeah. They sure are small. So, next, some shingles, eh? Yes, some shingles. Uh, let me explain a little bit about that. Uh, these are white cedar shingles. Most shingles that are sold, uh, and it, white cedar is the kind of cedar that grows on the east side of North America. So it's kind of indigenous to, to where I am in Canada. But most shingles that are sold in building supply yards are western red cedar shingles. What's the difference? Well, it's a different tree. Uh, 
Western red cedar is popular because it's such a big industry. They, they, they have great big cedar trees out there and their shingles go all over North America. I prefer the white cedar for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't, they don't, they don't weather as darkly. They stay a little bit lighter and they're a little bit stronger. The wood is a bit harder. So that's why I like these shingles. I buy these directly from the mill in New Brunswick. Waska is the name of the company. And I can get the, I can buy the shingles and have them shipped here to my property for less money than I can buy Western red cedar, cedar shingles in our local building supply outlet. So that's why I like to use them. Clear, in this case, means that there are no knots or defects. Um, well, that's what clear means in the wood department. But you can see there are some knots and defects. So, so what's going on? Well, that has to do with the, the grade B thing. Uh, it's clear in the five inches of area that you would leave exposed. So on your place, Robert, we use grade A clear, which means the whole shingle's clear. There's never any knots in it. For wall use, this is fine, uh, especially on an on, older building like this. Um, I mean, the grade A is nice, but it's not necessary for walls and uh, there's a cost savings. So a bundle like this, this will cover 25 square feet with the five inch exposure. And this bundle cost me $41 Canadian at the mill. And I had to pay some to have it shipped here too. It would be 60 something dollars for the same size bundle in grade A. So that's the difference, just a little bit of cost savings. And then this, this R and R reading and relaxing, or no, re rest no. and recreation. No, not quite. It um, it means uh, well. It, it refers to a process called a rebutting, which involves trimming the bottom edge of the shingles so that it's square to the sides uh, after the shingle is made. To so make sure it's ninety, which make sure it's ninety. And a normal building, not this one, would actually be an installation advantage. <laughs> well, it still is an installation advantage because you you want the bottoms to be in the same plane. You don't want them to be warm. Yeah, yeah, know. that's true. Look so, good. shall we uh, put that to the test with your square here and see how well they did? Um, it's supposed to yes. be rebutted and re squared. Well, I've so. checked these and and they're fine. They're not always fine. I mean, you bought a batch of shingles that were R and R shingles, and they were a little bit out. Some of them were, yeah. Let's just see. Yep. Perfect. Good. Here we have the shingle. I'm going to be putting it up against this temporary thing. And, but the building's wonky. So, uh, that's, that's plum. That's plum right now. But and it sure far, isn't tight to the trim. No, it isn't. The top. And so here's what I'm going to do. So you're going to have to unbutton and unsquare. Unbutton and unsquare. Um, so... Now, th this is taking me a lot longer than it does when I'm doing it because I'm explaining things. But you see that gap there? The gap at the top? The shingle's plumb. I get the gap at the top. I need to remove this amount of wood from down here. And I just kind of eyeball it. Like, well, there we go. So the distance is about from the tip of the knife to where this, this metal thing starts. So I go down here. I uh, eyeball it mark it I'm going to go over to my cutting table that's the i really like working with uh, these cedar shingles for, for side i would never put cedar shingles on a roof they don't last long enough in my opinion but on a sidewall this this can go 50 years without any kind of a finish on it it's going to last and last and, and it just does a great job but it's also they're nice to work with so and, and, and cutting is, is one of the ways they're nice because the wood is soft enough and thin enough that you can just go through with a utility knife. So I've got my mark there. Uh, of course, it's easier to go through on the thin end. But uh, three passes, three passes usually does it. Custom wonky shingle now. Custom wonky shingle now. And there we are. We're, we're a little bit, a little bit out, but not, not much. much. And it's it's going to be covered anyway. It's a good fit. Sure. Okay. Another couple of things before I nail this. Uh, you want to have sufficient overlap. 
So this is plenty of overlap. I'm going to say overlap, I mean covering the joints of the previous course. So I would take it down to about a uh, couple of inches of overlap. So if the shingle was narrower, I might still use it here. This would be insufficient overlap. And if I had a really wide shingle, I wouldn't want it to line up with the previous joint. So there we go. Now, another thing is when uh, is, is to decide um, in which direction you're gonna put the shingle. Because I, I could put it either way. I mean, I can now that I've trimmed the edge, but uh, technically you can put them either way. But you wanna, you wanna install the shingles so that any curling that might happen will happen inwards and not outwards. So take a look at that. Can, can you see how this shingle is, is, is curved a little bit? Can you see that? Um, yeah, I think so. A little bit. Does, it, does, it look, does it look more pronounced this way? Yeah, especially at the narrow end. Right. So all, almost all shingles have a little bit of a curve this way. They also, they also have a curve they also have a curve this way. You want to have the curve, the concave side in towards the building because if any more concavity sets in, it's going to be curving into the building and not curving out and having edges stick out. Now, I just have to nail this, this shingle on. I want a five inch exposure. So I want to put the shingles in six inches above the bottom edge. Put the staples. I'm oh, sorry, shingles, yeah, staples. The staples have to go six inches above the bottom of the ed of edge. Now, if I was doing a long run on a wall, I would take a string with some push pins and I'd go from one side to the other uh, at the six inch level. And that does two things. First of all, it lets me feed in a whole bunch of shingles and get the spacing right. I don't have to, to hold each one. I can put a whole bunch of them in. The string will hold it. And the string also shows me where to put the staples. It's not that critical. I just don't want to. I just don't want to get too high, or I certainly don't want to get down below the bottom edge of the shingle where it's going to be exposed. So, but before I um, fasten this on, let's just go around and I'll take. A, I'll show you the string on the on the long side that I was working on before. Uh, this is a bit complicated here because we've got plants and things, and uh, you know my wife Mary is constantly out here making sure that I don't damage these things. So it's a high stakes proposition. Uh, but here's the string, and you can see it's it's uh, about six inches above the bottom of the shingle. It held these shingles in place while I was putting them on, and it also showed me where to put the staples. So, now, staple. The best staple you can use to hold on the cedar shingle is the 7 16 wide staple like this. So 7 16 refers to the width of it. These are about an inch and a half long, which is plenty. I've got lots of wood here. The staple has to go through the shingle. It has to go through the distance of this dimpled thing. There's three quarter inch plywood and then there's old, very old, broken down three quarter inch thick pine siding. So there's lots of room for the, sh for the staple to be held invisible. Now, I, why do you want to use staples instead of nails? Ah, well, uh, stronger, you get a, a larger bearing surface, and faster with the nail gun. Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, with a staple gun, rather. I'm not aware of a nail gun that shoots the right kind of nails for cedar shingles. I do have some shingle nails because sometimes in tight quarters you can't get the staple gun in. So I have some uh, some shingle nails. Uh, they have a fairly large head, small shank. Um, that's what they're for. But this is much faster. And, and this is something I insist on, these are stainless steel. Um, moisture can get in here, uh, might just from osmosis and things, and it can cause rusting over the years. Uh, but not with stainless steel. So, got to order these in special. I can't get them locally at a reasonable price, but... Um, that's how that works. So let's put a shingle on. So a shingle this wide. Uh, I think I might put one in the middle. That's kind of on, kind of on the border. Um, wider than this, I definitely put three. Narrower than this, I probably put two. But but there you go. That's the process. So I'll just continue over with a few more shingles, and then I'll have to custom cut another one. So. 
progress isn't all that fast on this area, but that's the idea. And when I'm finished this, I will, I will pull this off. I can pull it off. The, the pins aren't, they don't hold all that well. And then I can use some pliers to just pull them out, throw these little pieces of wire into a can so that no one steps in it. And uh, then we just continue on up. So really good installation. That's gonna last a long time. Now I'm getting to the height where I wanna do something decorative. Um, I wanna make a band of decorative shingles. I, I have in mind to cut some in a semicircular shape and others in a kind of a diamond pointed shape. I'm thinking I'm gonna do some of that right about here on the wall and then also in the peak just to make it a little fancier. So the next time I talk to you about cedar shingles, that's what I'm gonna be showing you. So I hope you found this lesson in cedar sidewall shingling interesting. Uh, send me some questions. I think the world needs more of this stuff. This is a, a great way of making a durable, low maintenance siding that looks right in a rustic situation. It's kind of natural, but, but it lasts and it's not terribly expensive. So uh, drop me a line, visit my website. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Um, subscribe if you don't already on YouTube and hit the notifications bell so you know when I put out new videos. And um, check out the description box. My website's there and you can sign up for my famous Saturday morning newsletter. Thanks for joining me.